study of Joshua. And uh, interesting book. Very, very interesting book. Uh, we have, uh, we're well into the land. Joshua, the military leader, has, has taken Israel across the Jordan, has uh, prepared them through circumcision and other ways uh, for their battle. They have taken on this peculiar episode called Jericho. Uh, we've reviewed that strange, strange work that God did there and the, the uniqueness of that situation. Then we proceeded to higher ground. We took an attack on Ai, fumbled it, learned some spiritual lessons in terms of uh, seeking the Lord's counsel and in terms of ob obedience to his word. We saw what happened when Achan sinned. We saw what happened when Israel was set back. Uh, we may think that the judgment on Achan was a little severe, but God was setting an example, making it clear that he expects to be obeyed. And uh, he also pointed out to us in that episode how he deals with Israel corporately. One man's sin caused the entire nation to be set back and uh, at least it would appear, jeopardized the whole program. They uh, sought the Lord's counsel, repented, dealt with that sin, and then succeeded at Ai. And uh, that's where we were in chapter 8. We also, in chapter 8, saw this, uh, explored a little, both reviewed and also uh, looked behind a little bit in this business of the Mount, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, the blessings and the cursings. And uh, just by way of, of uh, a review. And that brings us to one of the strangest episodes in, in uh, the book of Joshua. It's an episode that's kind of amusing, kind of provocative, but is, has all kinds of, of, of lessons in it. And uh, uh, we could uh, indeed uh, spend a great deal. And we're in chapter 9, and, and this is uh, we're going to encounter some real characters, some real um, artists of chicanery here. And they're going to end up succeeding, doing something that may surprise you. And furthermore, um, well, let's get, we're getting ahead of the story, perhaps. Uh, what we might do before we move into this story is turn with me, if you will, uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, I want to sample some of the, the background um, that uh, we might have in mind before we jump into chapter 9. In the book of Deuteronomy, the book of the Torah, instructions from Moses, given to him by God, chapter 7, the first couple of verses, it says uh, in Deuteronomy, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land where thou goest to possess it, in other words, that's uh, they're in the wilderness, and, and, and when they enter the promised land, uh, to, when they enter the land that's been given to them, but to possess it, and that's obviously what's happening under Joshua, it says, um, And hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, seven nations, greater and mightier than thou, comma. And we've, we've highlighted that before. It's, it's provocative, of course, that the Israel is, being, is contesting, if you will, seven nations. There's three that are behind us now. And uh, there's seven left in the land. So when you ever have ten nations of which they're dealing with seven, we're reminded, of course, of Daniel uh, and Revelation, the, the uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns. And, uh, and uh, there, this is consistent with our suspicion that uh, Joshua is a foreshadowing of something far, much la far larger. Uh, in this, uh, I highlight that. But meanwhile, this... Instruction from Moses highlights to them that, that when, when God uh, sends you in the land and casts out these seven nations greater than you, verse 1 ending in a comma, verse 2, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And we've talked about this before. There's an undercurrent going on here that's far more uh, severe and deep than you and I would have any capacity to imagine because we tend to view this as being a little unmerciful, a little rough. They go in there and take no prisoners, so to speak, and, uh, and uh, they're instructed to do so in Deuteronomy. And that little piece of background, I also want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 20 to a, see a slightly modified instruction. 
As you can probably guess, the reason I'm highlighting this in Deuteronomy 7 is that we're going to see what appears to be a violation of that in, in, the, in, the, in, in the conquest of the land. And we're going to want, we want to look at that a little bit. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, um, there's another kind of instruction that's a little different. Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10 and 11. Uh, it says, When thou comest near unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if they make thee an answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all the people who are found therein shall be bondservants unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of your sword, and and on it goes. So we see what appears to be a contradiction. On the one hand, in Deuteronomy 20, they seem to be authorized to make a deal. And yet in Deuteronomy chapter 7, it's quite clear they are to make no deals. And that's going to be a little bit of a dispute that surrounds Joshua chapter 9. And clearly the specific instruction they had when they go into the land itself with regard to these seven nations, uh, they are to, um, to cleanse the land of those inhabitants. Those inhabitants uh, were viewed by God as defiling the land, and it was Israel's mission to cleanse the land. So with that kind of a heavy introduction, uh, let's see what happens uh, in chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9, verse 1, And it came to pass, when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan, and we're on the west side, incidentally, we're on the west bank, if I might be allowed that expression, uh, we're on this side of Jordan, in the hills and in the, in the Shephelah and in the borders of the great sea over against Lebanon, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite heard thereof, and they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. Now get the context. These nations have been hearing, their, you know, their scouts have told them what's going on. Jericho leveled. AI, apparently a false start, but AI taken also with a major route where they've all been killed. Um, so they're, they're rattled. And so they organized themselves. Uh, it says that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. Now from here we can go to a lot of interesting tangents. It'd be a fun time if you want to spiritualize this to go to Psalm 2 where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have a conversation among themselves, recorded some eight centuries before Christ was born, where they essentially make, they almost make fun of how the nations are taking arms against God. And of course it's referring to the end times, but it's interesting. There too, the nations gather themselves together against the Lord and against his anointed. And uh, Psalm 2 is a strange psalm, and, and I think we've been in that before, and I'm sure we'll have occasion to get into it again, so I won't take the time now, but I just note that this is an interest, this would be an interesting place to depart. One small detail, you know, I'm fond of making big issues out of trivial things. Um, you'll notice that in the nations, in this case, where they always list seven, in verse one, they only list six. For reasons that are a mystery to me, the Gergesites are overlooked. There are not seven nations there, there are only six. And there's no explanation. I've searched a number of commentaries, and I'm surprised that I've, I just not have found anyone that has taken note of that. And I have some peculiar commentaries. I would have thought somebody would have come up with some harebrained idea as to why the Gergesites are not listed in verse 1. But there's only six, not seven. And I have no idea. In answer to your questions in your mind, okay, what's Chuck driving at? Candidly, I have no idea. I have no clue. Uh, one possibility is that the Holy Spirit may have wanted six nations there to emphasize something. There may be a mystical significance to that that I have not fathomed. That's one possibility. The Holy Spirit does do that. He does take some liberties from time to time with lists to carry another message. Uh, in this case, it could be that for some reason the Gergesites weren't part of this league because we're talking about an alliance here of six nations. It's not going to mean a lot because when we get to chapter 10, there's five that really get heavy duty, and we're going to get into that. That's going to be a fun, fun chapter. I, I'm going to have all I can do to not get into chapter 10 tonight because I really want to devote a, a, a special time to that. So we're going to, I'm going to take my leisurely time through chapter 9. But uh, this chapter 10 is... It's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. But anyway, the point is, we have um, the six nations listed, which are six of the seven Gergesites overlooked for some reason. 
And they form a league. They gather themselves together to fight with Josh and with Israel with one accord. So the first thing you want to sort of get is the sort of the, the uh, public relations mood of the land. Uh, these intruders, these Israelis, have crossed the Jordan on dry land. They've leveled Jordan supernaturally with these guys who heard the most bizarre stories that they marched around, blew trumpets, the walls fell down. You've got to be kidding. Um, and then AI, uh, they just ambushed them and wiped them out. Uh, the, 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 the exploits of this strange people uh, seem to be continuing these legends they've heard that maybe 40 years before there's some bizarre stories going around how Israel crossed the, the, you know, the Red Sea on dry land and all of that. Wild stuff, which probably wasn't taken too seriously, but at this point with the crossing of the Jordan on dry land and these uh, early victories, uh, these nations are shook. Now you need to understand... These were not, uh, you know, farmers, uh, casual kinds of characters. These were not uh, nomads. Uh, these were the uh, these were warring guys. So the Canaanites and the Amorites and these guys were were tough turkeys. So they were used to uh, uh, playing rough, and um, uh, they they they. Uh, uh, when they when they took battle, they didn't mess around either. The males were typically. Uh, uh, Peeled, and then they'd take bets on who which one would die first, and that sort of thing. These guys, these are these were you know rough roughnecks. So when they get nervous, when they get frightened, you know there's apparently some good reasons, um, and there's going to be some some reasons that will startle you too before we're through in this with this whole episode. But the point is, they gather themselves together. Now there's one group of the Hivites that turn out to be remarkably resourceful. We're going to be both impressed and critical of these characters. One of the major towns in the Hivite that were populated by Hivites is a town called Gibeon. And these Gibeonites are going to do some interesting things. Verse 3. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done at Jericho and Ai, they did work wilily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wineskins old and torn and bound up. And then they took an old and patched shoes upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision. See, they're packing up to act like they're travelers. All the bread they put in their packs was dry and moldy. And they're wondering, what on earth is going on? These guys are going to pull a stunt that's really quite clever. You may not applaud their morality, but you have to be impressed with their practicality. Uh, and they really pull a stunt. And you may wonder, what on earth is going on? Well, the first point is, you're going to get involved here shortly in an interesting plot that these characters undertake. But the first thing to notice right up front, before we get too far in, is that Gibeon heard, Scripture tells us Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to uh, Jericho and Ai. Now, there's no information the Gibeonites had that the other tribes didn't. The other tribes chose to form an alliance and take up arms against Joshua. Dumb move, really, because uh, they, they're going to be outnumbered. God and anybody else tends to be a majority. Okay. Now, the Gibeonites, even before we get into this chicanery they indulge in, you should give them credit where credit's due. They're believers. And one thing that can get lost as we go into the story of the Gibeonites is the perception that they're sort of, in a sense, analogous to Rahab. They heard, if you will, if I can use this expression, the word of God. They'd heard the exploits of Israel. They understood that the God of Abram, Isaac, and Yaakov, or however you care to say it, was behind this invasion. So they're shook up. They understand that Israel is going to win. Now you say, well, that's kind of impressive. So they figured out a way to become part, you know, if you can't lick them, join them, right? Put yourself, if you will, in the position of being in the land. My encouragement to you would be not to be Amorites or Canaanites or whoever, but my encouragement in a sense of speaking 
No, I'm going to get a lot of criticism for this coming crack, but would be to be Gibeonites. Now, I'm not suggesting you do all the wild way they went at it. What I am suggesting is you don't fight God. You hear him, realize that the ultimate victory is his, and you set about to be part of his program, not fight it. The world won't do that. The world is going to go to war against God. It is at war against God now. James 4.4 4 tells us that it's at enmity with God. And so you can take this in a spiritual sense, and you can also take it in a more open sense as, a, as the times in which we live become more increasingly uh, visibly the end times and, and as the world becomes increasingly in conflict with the things of God, recognize that you're going to be in a position of joining one side or the other. The Gibeonites, in effect, found themselves by lineage and by predicament on the wrong side of the war. So they indulge in some rather bizarre tactics. It also appears that they were very well informed somehow about Israelis, Israel's uh, charter, its mission, its mandate. They knew that they don't take prisoners. They realize that if Israel understands that they live at Gibeon, they're done for. Facetiously speaking, it's as if they've read Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Make no covenant with them. Right? So if you're a Gibeonite, that's kind of a heavy insight. Here you got a group that you know is going to win because God's on their side, and oh, by the way, you're marked. You've had yours. It's, you know, they're going to nail you. It's got, to, it's, got, it's got to be an uncomfortable position to be on that side of the conflict. You and I are on that side of the conflict. We're in, intrinsically, naturally, at enmity with God. We may know he's going to win, but we don't admit it to ourselves. We take up arms against him. Every time you sin, that's a rebellion against God. So what do we do? We try to avail ourselves of the opportunity for his mercy. And we can do that. You and I can do that so easily it's in Jesus Christ. But that's uh, getting ahead of the story. Let's talk about the Gibeonites. So the Gibeonites hear that, the, you know, they, 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 they see what's going on. So they start, they work out a program. They're going to pretend that they're ambassadors of some far-off people. They're going to try to hide the fact that they live just over the hill. The Gibeon. They're going to form a caravan. They get themselves all dusty. They wear worn out shoes. They fill their pack with, uh, you know, last week's TV dinners, whatever. I mean, they really, they really dress it up here. They, they, uh, old sacks upon their uh, donkeys and they have wineskins, the old ones. Hatched, leaking. Um, the bread of the provision was dry and moldy. You get the picture, right? The intent is to convince Israel that they've come a long way. We don't live in this land. We're passing through. Okay? They want to put themselves in the position of Deuteronomy 20, not Deuteronomy 7. That's what they're trying to do. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal. Now, see, Joshua's base camp is close to Jericho. I mean, uh, close to the Jordan, excuse me. From the Jordan, you go up to Jericho, then Ai, you get into higher ground. There's some mountains. Gibeon's just over the mountains. But after Ai, they would go back to Gilgal. Gilgal is the base camp, if you will. That's their headquarters. Joshua's at Gilgal. These Gibeonites, in the form of a caravan, posing like they've come from a long way away, they, in verse 6, they said unto Joshua, and says unto the men of Israel, We have come from a far country. Now therefore, make ye a league with us. That is a covenant, a, a treaty. We've come a long, long way to make peace with you people. Verse 7, And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Perhaps ye dwell among us. How shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye, and from where come ye? Now that we are your servants, we, we, we at this point probably take as just sort of a you know, mid-eastern greeting. You know, I'm at your service. It's not clear that they're planning to be the slaves of Israel. That's where they're going to end up. Okay. But... Uh, uh, and, and they'll be glad to do that. You'll see before it's all over. Now, um, I might, this might be an interesting thing. That the Gibeonites are part, the, the, the Gibeonites are, are um, citizens of the town Gibeon. But Gibeon is part of the tribe of the Hivites. The word Hivites happens to mean serpent, by the way. 
kind of a colorful little insight there that I share with you at no extra cost. Um, now, they also are, de- in Genesis 10, verses 15 and 17, you discover that they're descendants of Canaan. Uh, and Canaan in, is, is, a, is accursed in Genesis chapter 9, 25. So if you're into this sort of thing, you can quickly determine that the Hivites, by being descendants of Canaan, carry on themselves a special curse. So they've got a, you know, a, a, a tough burden to carry, being Hivites. So, uh, but anyway, the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, perhaps ye dwell... That's what I want to explain when they say Hivites. They're using a broader term. It's sort of like somebody from San Francisco called a Californian, if you will. You see what I'm getting at? But, uh, so the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, perhaps ye dwell among us. How shall we make a league with you? And they said unto Joshua, we are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, who are ye and from where come ye? And they said unto him, from a very far country thy servants have come because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, the king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. Now, they're very clever. You have to recognize the subtlety of what they're doing. We've come a long way, and we've heard of the exploits you would come in the name of your God, the God that has done these incredible things, and they chronicle these incredible exploits very validly. It points out that uh, we have heard of the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. Well, that's safe. See, that was 40 years ago, right? The whole stories of Pharaoh and, the, and, and, and uh, the soldiers that couldn't swim, the whole routine. Okay. And he says, also there is a battle. We haven't focused on that, but obviously there was a battle between these two kings of the Amorites, Sihon and Og, that are also two other victories that uh, Joshua's involved with. But that was, on the, that was east of the Jordan. That was before they crossed over. That's before the book of Joshua. What's interesting, if you notice this carefully, how clever they are, they mention nothing about Jericho or Ai. See, that's local stuff. And they don't want to let them know that they've read the local papers. Because that would tip them off that they might be neighborhood folk. They're posing like they've come a long way. Well, they come over those mountains. That's a long as relative, right? But the point is they're creating this impression that they're from, from, from someplace along, far, far away. Um, and uh, King of Bashan, who is at Ashtaroth. Uh, Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, Take provisions with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you, but now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these skins of wine which were filled were new, and behold, now they're torn. And these are garments, and our shoes have become old by reason of the very long journey. There hangs the tail. Can't you just see them con these guys? They're just laying it on. They've got all the props. They've got all the makeup artists that have worked this out. They've, 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 uh, they've really, they, you know, they've, they've re- really done a number on, on the Israelites. And you may say, you know, recognizing these guys aren't fools, they've obviously prepared, rehearsed, planned this ruse. You'd say, gee, how could the, the Israelites, so they got duped, because they're obviously going to fall for this thing, right? How can you blame the Israelites? What you blame the Israelites for is not that they were conned. You and I, all of us can be conned. If you've done any reading at all about the con games, whatever they are, one thing you come away from is that any of us are eligible. If you think you can't be conned, you're the ideal person. (laughs) The guys that if you're, the, the kind of mark they look for is the guy who's confident that he can't be conned. It's not just a challenge, it's easier. It's easier. The guy that's tough is the guy that knows he can be conned. He does things like diligence. He does things like check things out. Because he knows he can be conned. So he's dangerous. The guy who's arrogant enough and prideful enough to know he can't be conned, hey, piece of cake. Piece of cake. Um, Where did the Israel, Israel make the mistake? In verse 14. And the men of their prov- and, and the men took of their provisions and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Ask not counsel. That's the, that's, the, that's the mistake. 
these guys were very clever. They were obviously well, well prepared, well rehearsed. So for Israel to be conned, almost probably any question they could have asked, they would have good answers. Where they blew it was not asking counsel of the Lord. You know, it's interesting if you study the life of David. David's the only person in the scripture where God speaks of him as a man after his own heart. And David blows it too, by the way. He makes a lot of mistakes. But the one thing you notice about the life of David, he's continually seeking counsel of the Lord. As you read through the books of Samuel and Kings and so forth, you see him again and again and again. Now, often he misses and he blows it. Sure, don't misunderstand me. But how often he asks counsel of the Lord. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He's put us in that predicament. I sometimes, with my tongue in my cheek and with, some, with, with serious reverence, suggest you view the Lord as lonely. He wants to hear from you. Why do you have problems? It's probably the only way he hears from you. Okay? He, um, sure. When things are going well, do you talk to him? No, you're too busy playing the next deal, right? Oh, you're in trouble. Your back's against the wall and you're really cornered. Hey, Lord. Eh, I thought you'd call. <laughs> wants to hear from you. He wants to hear from you. Seek counsel of the Lord. Sounds easy. But uh, the people who stay out of trouble are the people that walk with the Lord. And uh, Joshua was supposed to also. He was supposed to go to the priest. The, whether you use the Urim and Thummim or whatever. Uh, the point is, is that God had in instituted mechanisms for, for Joshua to be led of the Lord. And he didn't do it here. And that's where he blows it. Even though he blows it, I want you to notice what happens. It's interesting. So because they get this story... In verse 15, it says, Joshua made peace with them, made a league with them, and let them live. And the princes of the congregation swore unto them. In other words, Joshua's lieutenants, his senior guys, endorsed it. Hey, we made a covenant, we made a deal with these guys, they sat down, I don't know if they wrote it out in a treaty, but the point is they made a commitment to them. And Joshua and the leadership bought this story that these guys were ambassadors from a far, far off country. <laughs> Interesting. Troubles are just starting. Um, incidentally, uh, part of the problem, you also, just in try as we look at this and try to say, hey, what would we have done in the place? Uh, in Isaiah 28, 16, it says uh, that you, uh, he that believeth in the Lord does not make haste. Do you know that? You might want to more. Let's turn to Isaiah 28, 16. Isaiah 28, 16. I should probably put this up on my bathroom mirror because uh, because I uh, verse 16 is worth marking for lots of reasons because the main part of the verse I'm sure you're familiar with it says uh, in Isaiah 28 16 it says therefore thus saith the Lord God behold I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone a tested stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation what is that foundation? Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 deals with the idiom of the rock or the stone throughout the scripture. And that's an interesting idiom, by the way, because it's used so amazingly consistently. Whether it's the rock giving off water twice in the wilderness, although the rock is a different word in the Hebrew in both cases, but that's an interesting study in its own right. Whether the rock is the stone cut without hands that smites the image in Daniel 2, namely the return of Jesus Christ in power. Or whichever you're talking about, the rock and the cornerstone and so forth, it's the stone of offense, the rock of stumbling, or the stum a stone of stumbling, the rock of offense, and so forth. So we have that idiom here. But also there's an, a little, uh, you know, Isaiah gives us a little uh, uh, footnote, a little extra thing on there after the semicolon. He says, He that believeth shall not make haste. He that believeth shall not make haste. So if you and I are believers, we're not supposed to be in a hurry. God's not in a rush. God's not in a hurry. God is prepared. Whatever it is you need, he's done it a long time ago. So don't rush. He'll take care of it. I'd like to hear from you. I want you to walk in his guidance. Um, we're going to see just how bizarre his preparations can be in the next chapter. He does some preparations that when we explore will probably blow you away. Um, I'm getting ahead of the story. So Joshua and his princes make a league. Okay, now let's see what happens here. It sounds pretty neat. These guys have uh, organized themselves, come up with this wild, harebrained cover story. Uh, they've successfully conned Joshua and his leadership to buy the story, and they get their treaty. The Israelites aren't too happy about this. The rank and file. You, know, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can con the managers, 
you can con the seniors, but you can't con the rank and file. And I love it when I go into a company to analyze things. One of the first places I try to develop a relationship is the guy in the stock room, you know, because you can go through the numbers and the accountants can confuse you, but, you know, the guy down in the stock room and the people that really run the company, they know who's conning who. You can't con them. And so, uh, anyway, uh, getting, I'm off the subject. Uh, verse 16, it came to pass at the end of three days, after they had made a league with them, that they heard that they were their neighbors and that they dwell among them. Oh, boy. You know, cat's out of the bag. You know, did you check their license plates? They're just across the hill here. And the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon, Chephira, Beroth, and Kiriath Jirah. Jerim, or something like that. Um, and these will come up in Joshua chapter 18 again, so I'll have another opportunity to mispronounce them. Um, see, actually, it's, uh, Gibeon was the lead city, but there's three cities around there. It was a, a group, you know, a, a one zip code right there. Okay. And uh, the children of Israel smote them not, because the princes of the congregation had sworn, and, sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. Now, this congregation is good at murmuring, you know. They've done a neat job. They've done a neat job all for 40 years through the wilderness. Incidentally, I, did, I meant to check this and I forgot to. I'm not sure they murmur much in the book of Joshua. This is the only place I can think of offhand. They blow it like they did at Ai. But this business of murmuring, which becomes such a common theme throughout the book of Numbers, you know, everything from Moses, you know, you... you, you you, you have to, every time I read the Jerusalem Post and I read what the various political leaders in, in Israel have to put up with, I, I, I can't imagine running for political office anyway. It's not my thing. But the last place in the world I could imagine wanting to be a elected leader would be in Israel. Those people are impossible. Those people are impossible. And so when I read Numbers and read the Torah and I read the, uh, Moses, I feel sorry for the guy. I mean, he really has his hands full. And... Uh, uh, the murmurs, but anyway, here, here they're murmuring now against the princes with Joshua, and um, but it's interesting that they they honor the commitment. See, verse nineteen. But all the princes said unto all the congregation, "We have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now therefore, we may not touch them. This we will do to them. We will even let them live, lest wrath be upon us because of the oath which we swore unto them." You know, this is. One of the heaviest lessons, I think, in this chapter. Because if ever you could find a valid excuse for the Joshua and the prince to say, hey, wait a minute, guys, you lied to us, the oath is no effect, off with their heads. You could say this would work, right? I mean, they lied. They misrepresented. This could be overturned in any U.S. court of law. Hey, you know, it's uh, you know, fraudulent transfer or whatever the buzzwords are. I mean, this, you know, the thing was built on fraudulent grounds the material representations upon which the thing hung were wrong. They were lies. And it wasn't casual. It was premeditated chicanery that caused this all to happen. Is Joshua, is Joshua and, the, and, and Israel committed to this covenant with the Gibeonites? I can visualize the debate. I can visualize someone saying, open up the Torah, Deuteronomy 7, saying, hey, God told us not to make a league with these people. They're supposed to be killed. That's God's will. It's expressed here, expressed in his word. And furthermore, this, this covenant that made, hey, that was on false ground. They lied to us. It fits people who aren't here. These guys live here. Off with their heads. Can you buy that? I can embellish that a little bit and convince you, I think. That isn't what happened in the Scripture. That is not what happened in the Scripture. Despite the basis of the oath, they honor it. And God blesses their honoring it. We're going to discover that the God blesses it in a way you may not believe. Because Gibeon, we're going to shortly see, is going to be under attack by, their, by the rest of these, you know, their former neighbors. It's interesting that the neighbors are going to go against Gibeon, not against Joshua. And Gibeon sends a message for help. And that leads to the most famous battle in the Bible. More famous than Jericho, really, in a sense. A battle in which Joshua asks the sun to stand still, and it does. Now, one of the things we're going to we're going to spend some time on that subject because 
no matter how sincerely you may glare at me with those bright eyes and say, I believe all that, deep down inside you've got to have difficulty with the idea that the Earth's rotation stopped. I mean, it doesn't take a lot of astrophysical insight to realize that that's a tough bill. And we're going to spend some time on that. I'll cure your suspense. I believe he did. And I believe there's evidence of it. And the evidence is so dramatic and, will, and, and so altered my view of all of history that uh, that'll be a whole subject we'll get into. But the point is, the point I want to make is the Battle of Beth Horon that comes up in chapter 10 where the day wasn't long enough for Joshua to clean house on behalf of the Gibeonites. Did God honor that battle? He set up meteorites, who knows how many hundreds of years before, that land and kill Joshua's enemies. You want to talk about marksmanship, there are more people killed by the meteorites than by the sword of Israel's soldiers. And not one Israeli was lost. That's a bizarre meteor shower. How did that happen? We'll talk about it when we get there. So, this is, the more you study the Gibeonites, the, more, the stranger the story becomes. I don't, I'm not trying to paint them as good guys, because they're going to end up being a thorn in Israel's side for a long, long time. But they aren't treated by God as the bad guys. He honors his commitment. Now, you and I have a lot of tough lessons out of this one. It's called keeping an oath. It's called keeping an oath. Nowhere, that, to my knowledge, does God ask you to swear an oath. Nowhere that I know of, offhand, do I know a place where God requires you to swear an oath. But, having sworn an oath, oh, he expects you to keep it. And that's probably the heaviest aspect that I know of in the issues of divorce. Because we spend a lot of time in Christian doctrine trying to understand the complexities of marital relationships. Because clearly there's some really practical concerns in our day-to-day -day lives of, of, uh, of broken homes and, and places where uh, divorce occurs for whatever reasons. And clearly the Scripture talks a lot about divorce. There's the Old Testament view of divorce and Christ himself makes comments the New Testament. That's a whole study that I'm not about to get into tonight. But the one dimension of that that bothers me quite apart from all of that, does divorce break an oath? And if that's true, then I do sure do some studies about how God treats oaths. Now, uh, Christ's shed blood avails for us all, and it's for all your sins the ones you've committed in the past and the ones that you still have maybe ahead of you. What did I say maybe for? Uh, just that's a figure of speech. Uh, certainly, we all have, we all stumble. And so I don't want to put anyone on a big trip because Christ's shed blood is available for it all on the one hand. On the other hand, it's important for us to understand that God takes oaths seriously. And you can do a study of oaths throughout the scripture. It's a worthwhile study. But I'll, I'll just focus right now on the Gibeonites. Here's a place where Israel was cheated. They were defrauded on a non-material matter. They made an oath. They honored it, and God blessed them for it. God blessed them for it. It fascinates me to realize that chapter 10, the Battle of Beth Horn, the long day of Joshua, the issue was the defense of the Gibeonites. You know, I could have easily expected in chapter 10 when the Gibeonites uh, yell for help that uh, maybe Israel in good intentions say, hey, we're going to help those guys, and God judges them because, hey, you weren't supposed to make leagues. I could visualize the story turning around the other way. God somehow having another AI, so to speak, where they have a defeat because they weren't supposed to make a league with the Gibeonites. That's not what happened. Boy, did God go to their aid? You can't believe the events of chapter 10. They're wild. Wild. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, so um, to Israel, a commitment's a commitment. To God, a commitment's a commitment. Now, they do add a few footnotes to the deal. Their commitment was to let them live. Huh? So, uh, in verse 21, the princess said unto them, Let them live, but... Kind of an important word to the Gibeonites, I think. <laughs> but, let them be... Hewers of wood 
and drawers of water unto all the congregation as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spoke to them, saying, Why have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you when ye dwell among us? Now therefore ye are cursed. And there shall none of you be freed from being slaves, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And this happens to fulfill the curse that was given in Genesis chapter 9. Turn back to Genesis chapter 9. There's a curse upon Canaan. No, um, no, uh uh-uh. Ham is the father of Canaan. And, um, so in, 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 um, in Genesis chapter 9, we have, uh, uh, a peculiar, uh, event that occurs with Noah. I don't want to get into that right now, other than he sinned and, 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 I mean that they sinned against him. And, uh, uh, when Noah was drunk and, uh, he, he was upset about, uh, what came down. He said, verse, in verse, uh, um, uh, 9, 25, and 26, it says, uh, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So Canaan was was prophesied to be the servant of Shem. Out of Shem, of course, comes Israel, and out of Canaan came the Hivites. And out of the Hivites come the Gibeonites, and the Gibeonites turn out to be, there may be other ways this is fulfilled too, but I'm focusing right now on the Gibeonites, who are by role, by, by, by position, from this day on, the menials in the temple. For it isn't obvious when he said earlier here, the congregation, but it is amplified, we get to verse 23. It says, And the hewers of wood and the drawers of water, for the house of my God. But Joshua commissions them to be. <coughs> Excuse me. Is the slave labor, if you will, the hewers of wood and the drawing of water, which is, which is like, uh, you know, that's minimum wage stuff. That's down there. And, uh, that's what they do uh, for the uh, temple. Now, um, uh, it's interesting to notice that they there's two dimensions to this. On the one hand, God honors them in the sense that, number one, their commitment is honored. They weren't put to death. They are given this, their, their burden in exchange for that is to be the hewers of wood and the carriers of the drawers of water for the temple. It's interesting that Saul, in his zeal for Israel, and perhaps misapplying Deuteronomy 7 or ignoring a thing, attempts to, or in fact apparently does somewhat, uh, slaughters the Gibeonites, attempts to wipe them out. And David makes amends for that after after the death of Saul, and he calls the Gibeonites in. Well, there's a a famine for three years, and God tells David it's because he wants the Gibeonites avenged against Saul. So David calls, all this is in, in 2 Samuel 21, David calls the Gibeonites in and says, what would you have? And he says, we would not have any gold or silver from Saul's house, nor do we want you to kill anybody on our behalf. We just want seven of his kids. And that's what David gives them. He spares the descendants of Jonathan because of the commitment he made with Jonathan, but he does serve up seven that get hung. In, in restitution to the Gibeonites for Saul's injury to the Gibeonites. You may read that. That's a bizarre story. It highlights the fact that Israel had a commitment to the Gibeonites. King Saul had violated that. And God himself wanted that straightened out. He sends a famine to the land. And David, I assume through Nathan or some mechanism, was told that that famine will be there until he fixes, the, sets that right. And so he sets restitution for the Gibeonites. Strange story. But it highlights the fact that God, the Gibeonites are under the protection of God. Why? Because of this commitment that they made them back here. Now, it's interesting. You can track the Gibeonites. Also, the descendants of the Gibeonites are known as the Nethanim, and they, are, they become, yes, the menials of the temple, but they become a very elevated form of menial. In other words, they are they evolve into a position of privilege in the formal temple later. Okay, I mean, as as as, as Israel matures and as this whole thing goes on, uh, the Nephinim are are the descendants of the Gibeonites, and they have this peculiar charter. And so often happens in a situation, a very menial job originally can become a position of honor, because it is, after all, 
a menial position in the temple. And to the extent that the temple is the house of God, having a token role in the temple is, uh, is pretty neat. It's pretty neat. So, uh, so the Nethanim are, are honored people. So, so, um, now, uh, so there's two sides to the Gibeon story. Number one is they obviously were chicanery, and they obviously it, it ex- it exacted this peculiar commitment on the part of Joshua and his leadership. There's another dimension here that I think God would have us be sensitive to. On the one hand, they made a commitment and God held them to it. And he honors that commitment throughout the scripture by the dramatic victory we're going to encounter in chapter 10 by David avenging Saul's injury to the Gibeonites and so on. So it's clear that God's sanction is upon the commitment they made, which says don't make commitments lightly. God will expect you to honor it. Even though the commitment may be something that God doesn't want you to do. If you make an oath, you've got that commitment. And, and so uh, that's, a, that's a very heavy lesson as you, as you take that all through. But there's another lesson that's involved. Uh, the Gibeonites become a thorn in Israel's side. There's one issue after another that occurs throughout the scripture where these Gibeonites are a problem. And in fact, the very fact that David had to serve up Saul, some, you know, Saul's kin, seven of them, to be hung, is a non-trivial now, they have this famine for three years because of the Gibeonite. In other words, this whole Gibeon thing becomes a headache they live with uh, throughout the rest of the time. You might turn with me to Exodus chapter 12 to see a similar kind of lesson laid out. And God deals in patterns, and he, he would have us, I believe, be sensitive to certain instructions that he has. Um, Exodus chapter 12, uh, of course, deals with... Um, you know, the Passover. And they're about to leave Israel. I mean, they leave Egypt. Passover night, you know the story, how they uh, put the blood on the doorpost and so forth. The death angel passes over Egypt, and the firstborn of the Egyptians, cattle and so forth, are, are taken. But and, and of the Israelites, too, if they don't have blood on the doorposts. But those, uh, and, and you know the story. Well, then, of course, they get, after the next morning, they're on their way, right? In verse 37, the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men besides the children. And verse 38, it's the mixed multitude that probably are part of the instigators of Aaron messing around with the golden calf when they have their, you know, uh, backsliding. When Moses is up on the hill for 40 days and they lose patience and they go back to worshiping the golden calf and that whole routine. Um, And... uh, 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 and by the way, just as an aside, if you weren't an Israelite or didn't have the insight of God, you'd be worshiping a golden calf too. And you may not know what I mean by that. But wait till we get to chapter 10, you'll understand what I mean. Um, we glibly look back and say, isn't that quaint? Isn't it quaint that these people worship these idols? See, we come from the smugness of the insight that God has given us from the scripture, part one. And part two, we have no insight. We have no insight and as to the panic and anxiety that people lived in prior to 700 B.C. for reasons that we'll come to. So, uh, uh, but the point is, is this mixed multitude, I'm getting ahead of this, this mixed multitude is um, a real source of difficulties. Turn to Numbers 11. Now, this chapter 11 in the book of Numbers is the murmurers, the complainers. This is one of the many episodes where there's, they've got problems. But all I want to do is highlight verse 4. Because they're, they're, they're moaning and groaning and, giving, and having a hard time. And uh, verse 4 says, the mixed, And the mixed multitude that was among them fell to lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? And so forth. They're griping and complaining, and if you watch the book of Numbers carefully, you'll discover behind the scenes the people that are stirring up trouble are the mixed multitude. These were not people of Israel. They were extras that tagged along, camp followers, non-Israelis. They weren't supposed to leave with Egypt with them, and they become a source of problems all the way through. To show you how maybe a little learning takes place, turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. The scene here now is after they've been re- they've gone to captivity Babylon for 70 years and under the leadership of Nehemiah they are released they are released and and uh, their 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 issue is to rebuild the temple right in Nehemiah chapter 13 
And a lot of what Nehemiah has to do is with this whole issue of people who want to help you obey the will of God. You've got a ministry, you've got some mission, and you've got people there that want to help. They've got money, they've got resources. One of your great difficulties is are they, in biblical terms, a mixed multitude? Because Nehemiah has people who want to help, and they mean well. They really want to help, but they don't understand that Israel was called to separation. In Nehemiah chapter 13, um, uh, the book of Moses is being read in the hearing of the people, and it was found, verse 1, that the Ammonite and the Moabite could not come into the congregation for God forever because they met not the children of Israel with bread and water, and they hired Balaam against them. These are all the bad things that the, the Ammonites and the Moabites did in the past, and, and how he would curse them, howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Verse 3, Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. See, the point was, that's what they should have done in this Torah. They've learned their lesson, at least to some extent, and that seems to be the emphasis in Nehemiah. You're saying, gee, that's all kind of interesting, Chuck. What has that got to do with us? Well, all kinds of things. Uh, one place we could turn to is the second... Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. You know it. You don't have to look it up. Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. If you're in Christ, you're in a new creation. What does that mean about your old associations, your old habits, your own contacts? Well, at least it should be. I'm not saying you should sever it all off and go separately, but it certainly means that you want to be on the guard uh, for a mixed multitude in your life. If you're a new creation in Christ, you're a new creation in Christ. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, Matthew 13 has some kingdom parables. And you recall the story in Matthew 13 about the tares and the wheat? An enemy does that. And that can apply to your life. It can apply to your ministry. You know, are there tares? You know, it obviously refers to a congregation, a fellowship. There's also one of the, the fourth of those parables talks about a woman hiding leaven in three measures of meal. Three measures of meal were supposed to be unleavened. It was a fellowship offering. The woman hiding leaven, leaven was a type of sin. Why, why is leaven a type of sin? Because it corrupts by puffing up. Same sin, it is a type of sin, but its source of sin is pride. The original pride was in, in Isaiah 14 in the heart of Satan. I will be like the Most High. Pride is the source of all sin, fundamentally. Leaven is a type, a Levitical example. You throughout the Scripture, Old and New Testament, is a type of sin. So this woman hides sin, leaven in three measures of meal. The three measures of meal were supposed to be kept unleavened, holy. They were sacred to the Lord. It was a fellowship offering. So what, Christ has a whole message, and that's a, we don't have time to go into the whole uh, uh, thing right now, but the point is, is that we have to keep the leaven out of our lives. And that can be have to do with fellowships. That doesn't mean we don't mix with unbelievers. How can you witness if you don't? He hasn't called you to a monastic life. I know of no scripture that calls you to a monastic life. The whole monastery idea is, is, is uh, uh, missing the point, the Great Commission. You're supposed to be witnesses. How can you be witnesses if you, a couple of you go and hold off behind some walls and don't mix, you know, not in the world? You just not be of the world. So you need to be visible as witnesses. But you're not of the world. That means you've got to disengage uh, habits and associations in a sense that they are uh, impediments or baggage to your spiritual growth. And one of the burdens you have is to examine your life to see if in your relationships there's a mixed multitude, especially if you're in a ministry. You, want to be, you may be getting well-intended, well-intended help but it may not be that which God has sanctioned. So that's the whole, there's a whole study you can do about the role of the mixed multitudes in Exodus and those overtones, of those ideas can you know, carry on through the Gibeonites here. Because here's the Gibeonites, who in this case, by a ruse and chicanery, got themselves involved under a legal contract to be in the camp of Israel. And Israel deals with that. On the one hand, by honoring their oath, that's good. Uh, they also uh, give them the role of being uh, the servants of, of, of the temple. But uh, it's not as if the whole thing is laid to rest, because they do become a thorn in their flesh, a, a problem, if you will, uh, in Israel's administration uh, uh, throughout the, uh, the uh, you know, subsequent uh, uh, eras, the Gibeonites. Interesting group of guys. And uh, so... Um, so uh, anyway, uh, they become the, uh, the hewers of wood and drawers of water for the house of my God, verse 24. And the answer Joshua said, Because it was certainly told thy servants how the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and destroy all the inhabitants of the land from before you, therefore we were very much afraid of our lives because of you and have done this thing. And now, behold, we are in thine hand, and as it seemeth good and right unto thee to do, 
unto us do. And so he did unto them, and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, that they slew them not. And Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, in the place which he should choose. So uh, that's uh, uh, chapter 9. Uh, interesting story of the Gibeonites. There's a lot of lessons here. There's lessons, first of all, that we shouldn't make treaties quickly. We should wait upon the counsel of the Lord. In your life, there's opportunities to make deals, commitments, treaties. And, and uh, 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 the Lord would have you seek his counsel. How do you seek his counsel? Boy, that's a study in its own right. By being in his word, he will speak to you through his word. By being in fellowship with believing counselors. In many counselors, there is wisdom, Scripture tells us. The successful ministries are ones that have, are subject to a board of uh, um, spirit-led men who will guide. I, I, it's fascinating to me to watch some fabulous luminaries on the Christian scene rise and sometimes fade. The ones that fade are because they may not have been listening to their board or not have had a board of counsel. And yet you see other guys who have somehow amazingly survived. I'm thinking of Graham, for example. Through decades of controversy, you know, all kinds of waves of Christian controversy hit the, hit the scene. And how interesting it is that in general, maybe a few exceptions, but in general, the Graham ministry has kept clear of some of those traps, those potholes in the road. And my, uh, he obviously is walking close to the Lord, and I, I believe that he also has a, a board of counselors that he listens to that keep him from getting caught up in some of these bramble bushes that the other ministries get tangled up in. And uh, um, I, I think that's also true of companies, that companies tend to mirror their board of directors. I think ministries tend to be um, influenced heavily, the ones that are successful, by, by having good counselors. Many counselors are wisdom. It's important to seek counsel of the, uh, of the Lord, and uh, he will speak to you in his word. Those of you that are really in his word on a daily basis uh, uh, will hear his voice. Uh, he'll, 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 he'll speak to you. But uh, having made a commitment... It's clear the Scripture teaches us to honor it, to stick with it. To, to and my recommendation, if you haven't put that in your notes, is don't make oaths. Um, you're going to blow it, and when you blow it, you'll get on a trip. You'll trip, and it's a, you don't make oaths. The Lord holds you accountable for oaths. And um, and then this whole what's also lying underneath the whole Gibeonite story is this concept of separation. Be separate from the world. Now, some of us who are very active in business, uh, that's a, that can be a, a, a tough thing to somehow come to practical terms with. How can you, you have to obviously be aggressive and involved to be contributing you know, economically and other ways to help people fulfill themselves and finding professional satisfaction. So it says you can't be standoffish, you're in there working. But how do you do that and stay um, not of the world? Tough call. Part of it's by walking by the Spirit on a moment-to-moment, day-by-day basis, which you can expect to do imperfectly but uh, beneficially to the extent that you can. And so uh, that really concludes chapter 9. Um, it gives me no choice but to jump into one of my favorite chapters and try to get you interested and yet not not steal all my thunder for next time. So um, what we're going to do is take a brief look at chapter 10, and uh, we're going to, to uh, 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 focus our attention on the first chapter 10 is a long chapter and it has lots of things in it but the thing that will attract your attention the thing that will uh, 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 for which you all may have come tonight <laughs> is to explore a little bit is the battle of Beth Horon that name is uh, will become indelibly Im- uh, uh, impressioned upon you and uh, uh, since we talked about the Gibeonites uh, uh, I think one of the ways to do this would be to just jump into chapter 10 verse 1 and take a look at the historical or, or geographic and, and you know the context that, that that the battle leads up to. So uh, we have the Gibeonites uh, again to sort of recap. In the early part of chapter nine, the kings of the land are are uh, have affiliated themselves and they're really concerned about Joshua and his antics. And then we have this bizarre episode of the Gibeonites making this treaty with Israel. So in chapter 10, we're going to focus on a specific group of kings who are really upset about this. Gibeon was in the central part of the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the land. I might mention that the whole issue with the Gibeonites has another dimension to it, too. 
by the Gibeonites not being wiped out, by the Gibeonites making this treaty to, with Israel, they thus become a band, if you will, of separation between the northern and southern kingdom. And some uh, scholars believe that the Gibeonites, that, 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 that partition, if you will, that dividing into the north and south culturally may have set the roots for the civil war that evolves you know, uh, after David, after Solomon, when we have Rehoboam and Jeroboam, they go in the civil war, and the kingdom is divided into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And uh, well, the northern kingdom is known then as the house of Israel, and the southern king, the ha house of Judah. And uh, as you uh, are well aware, after in the divided monarchy, we have, we have after that, the, the course of events for both kingdoms. The house of Israel, going from bad to worse. Idolatry is embraced earlier and more despicably, and the house of Israel, the northern kingdom, eventually gets judged by God having Sennacherib, uh, the king of Assyria, take them captive, from which they don't survive, in a sense. In other words, they go into captive, captivity under Assyria, and they never survive. The southern kingdom survives longer because they have some revivals, and they do a little bit better, but things degrade there, too. And ultimately, God judges them, too, by going to the southern kingdom, the house of Judah, goes into captivity under the Babylonians. And... Um, and from this partition, you emerge the, uh, the whole idea of the lost ten tribes, because the northern kingdom is regarded by some to be consist of ten tribes, and the southern kingdom, two tribes. It's actually three, it's Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon. But the point is that they nevertheless like to call the northern ten tribes, the so-called lost ten tribes of Israel. And that, that's the presumption that the northern kingdom consisted of a clean ten tribes, and that they went into, Assyri into slavery under Assyria and then disappear from history. The southern kingdom, which can be geographically defined as the territories that were given to, to uh, uh, Judah and uh, Simeon, uh, are, are uh, particularly are, uh, are, uh, end up in Babylon, and later, after 70 years' captivity, get released, go back to the land. So the naive observer says, gee, there's a lot, ten lost tribes, and there's a whole thing that comes across ten lost tribes, and I got off on this a little bit, but it's worth my mentioning to you, that there are no lost ten lost tribes. Because during those days, the northern and southern kingdoms commingled. And when the northern kingdom, uh, the house of Israel, was going increasingly to idolatry, the faithful in the land migrated south where they were still worshiping properly. So there's not a clean division in the first place. And the ones that were left up north were the apostates, the, uh, the backsliders, the idolaters. They were taken into captivity. The southern eventually degenerate too and they go into slavery in Babylon. What everybody ignores is that Babylon in the meantime had conquered Assyria. So where do you think those slaves were that the Assyrians had? They became Babylonian. I mean they, they took them over. When the southern house was taken into slavery, who do you think they where do you think they put those slaves? In with the others. So you'll discover, and if you can find passages in Second Chronicles to support this, is that there is no tenal there that that, that that the kingdom was divided. And there are prophecies in Zechariah and elsewhere that they're going to be reunited again. But there isn't ten lost tribes. Want proof of that? Read any of Peter's letters. They're addressed to the twelve tribes of Israel. The New Testament speaks to the twelve tribes of Israel. Any doctrine, and there's a whole thing so sometimes goes by the name of British Israelism, which is nonsense. It's not scriptural. There are no ten lost tribes. It's an idiom of literature, not of not of not of the scripture. And uh, you can uh, and we don't have to get into that all tonight. Other than this whole issue is something you may run into, but more importantly, the roots of that civil war that divided Israel into two in the north and the south uh, could have had, in a cultural sense maybe, part of its roots in the Gibeonites, which were right, strata, right in the middle. And, and that could start to cause the sectional division, the lack of identity, the lack of cohesiveness culturally in the land that gave, set the groundwork for uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam to have their, their thing after the death of Solomon. And so... Uh, uh, it's interesting how you can, you know, we could get into that thing too, but it's really uh, uh, perhaps off the subject. It's just some background relative to how many of the things that occur later have their roots in issues here. You can argue that these issues had their roots in Genesis, and certainly um, uh, the things that happened in Joshua had their roots in, in the Torah, and certainly the things that happened in the monarchy have their roots in, 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 in Joshua. So it's, uh, and we'll deal with more of that when we see the land divided up chapters. But in any case, we have the Gibeonites, they made their deal. They're, they've got theirs. So they're well taken care of, and the word seems, there seems to be good communication in this land because the enemy seems to find out about these things pretty quickly. Because in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass, when Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai, 
and had utterly destroyed it, and as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. Now, by the way, you notice a couple of things in verse 1. The first thing you can't help but stumble over is his peculiar name. The king of Jerusalem has a name, Adonai Zedek. Now, that could very well be more of a title than a name, but as was so common in the early empires, the title and the name get commingled. Pharaoh of Egypt. That was a title, not a name, but he was Pharaoh. And uh, 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 Caesar. We speak of Caesar. It was a title, and yet it's also a name. So uh, Adonai Zedek is... Uh, we know back in Genesis 14 there was a, a very unusual character that was the um, king of Jerusalem, Melchizedek. And Melchizedek shows up in a strange way when Abraham gives him tithes and so forth. And he would probably disappear into the murky, murky fogs of history had not Psalm 110 make reference to him and the writer of the book of Hebrews make a big deal of the fact that uh, his priesthood was not Aaronic. It was before Moses and all of that. And the writer of the book of Hebrews points out that our high priest, none other than Jesus Christ, is not after the order of Aaron, because that was limited. It was of the law, and it had its end. It's after the order of, a, uh, order of Melchizedek, who in the scriptural sense has no beginning and end. That doesn't mean he lived forever. It just means that scripturally he's described as not having a beginning or an end, and the writer to Hebrews uses that argument to argue that rhetorically speaking, Christ is of that order. The order of, he's a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And that whole thing in Hebrews is an important study. So Melchizedek would disappear from our notice had it not been made a big thing. Well, Melchizedek, Melchizedek means king, and Zedek means righteousness. Now, we're now in a totally different period. This is much, much later. Uh, Jerusalem is, uh, becomes the stronghold of the Jebusites, and that's a whole other thing. But the point is, at this particular time, when Joshua is entering the land, uh, Jerusalem is a very principal city. It has a leader. And this leader calls himself by an interesting name. It's not Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem. He calls himself Adonai Zedek. Now, what does Adonai mean? The Hebrew test there. Dear Lord. He's the Lord of righteousness, Adonai Zedek. Now, why am I making a thing of this? I think it's interesting, as you have heard me before, and you'll hear me again, I think that the book of Joshua is a foreshadowing of the book of Revelation, and I think a lot of structural hints the Holy Spirit has planted here to point us in that direction. And so I think he'd have us conscious of the possible parallels that are, are evident here. Adonai Zedek becomes the leader of a confederacy, and uh, just as the book of Revelation describes the world under a leadership of a confederacy and has a leader who calls himself God who causes himself, enforces, under capital punishment, himself to be worshipped. Book of Revelation. So we use the term Antichrist, which is an unfortunate term, but he's a very strange leader that sur surfaces in the scripture, has let no less than 50 titles, and, and it could very well be that this chapter 10, this Adonai Zedek, is in a model sense, or a foreshadowing sense, yeah, at least in some dimensionality, a hint or a foreshadowing of that, that ultimate conflict that Revelation talks about. But here, anyway, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and utterly destroyed it, and as he'd done to Jericho and her king. What Adonai, what's bothering Adonai Zedek isn't just that Jericho and Ai fell. He took note of what they did to their kings. And he gets a little uncomfortable. His collar gets a little tight as he realizes that part of their uh, modus operandi here is to take the king and hang him on a tree till evening. And he doesn't have that in mind for himself, so he's getting concerned. So uh, the, uh, he also hears and says also, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon made peace with Israel and were among them. Now the result of all of this, Jericho, the defeat of Jericho, the defeat of Ai, and now Gib Gibeon was an important part of their defense. Gibeon was strong, a major strategic position, both in the highlands and by the power of their people. And now they find out that they have defected. They've gone and joined Israel. They've made their deal with Israel. So Adonai Zedek's upset about that. Verse 2, And they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. So in other words, Gibeon wasn't just a neat little you know, bunch of guys that happened to pull off a, shoot, a shrewd little chicanery. It was a very, very major power center. And I think it's, it's fascinating to me to realize that they had the perception to recognize that Israel was to be dealt with in something other than swords. And, and uh, so you can, you can quarrel with their techniques, but it worked. They survived. And uh, it says, speaks for itself. Verse 3. Wherefore Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, the king of Hebron, and Piram, the king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, the king of Lashish, and the 
unto Debir, the king of Eglon, saying... Now, by the way, these are no trivial guys either, particularly Lashish, because we find that when you study Lashish all through the scripture, it's a tough place to, 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 uh, to, to get beat down. Uh, Sennacherib uh, lays the siege to uh, Lashish and gives up. Uh, the Babylonians do eventually lay it. So in later years, there were Lashish, whatever reasons, the ter uh, terrain or whatever, is a tough, tough place to conquer. So these five kings are a formidable force. These guys are going to take some pretty heavy artillery to put down. That's exactly what the Lord orders up, as you'll see shortly. But the interesting thing is, these five kings, they get together, in verse 4 it says, uh, Adonai Zedek says to these other four guys, Come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Well, now wait a minute, that's a little weird. I can understand Adonai Zedek and these other four kings saying, Hey, we're in trouble. Our major line of resistance, the Gibeonites, have defected. We better get ourselves a line to go after Joshua. That's always saying. We're going to get our act together and show those Gibeonites what defectors get. That's strange. Isn't that strange? Let me digress a little bit. Isn't it interesting that there is no such thing as the Battle of Armageddon? If you've studied with us in the book of Zechariah, you know that Armageddon is to the battle what uh, England was to the Normandy invasion. It's a staging ground. The battle isn't intended to be an Armageddon. The battle, all the nations, Zechariah 12 tells us, come up against what city? Jerusalem. Megiddo is the place that they're gathering to for that attack. And yet when we look at Isaiah 63, we discover that, that hey, uh, what's the Lord doing fighting for his people at Edom, at Basra? Why did all these forces that were supposed to go against Jerusalem go after Basra? Because Satan is after the remnant. The remnant have retreated and hidden in Basra, and when the remnant petitioned the second coming of Jesus Christ, three days later he comes. Satan knows that, and he's got to keep that from happening. So while the main objective is presumably Jerusalem, he focuses forces to wipe out the remnant that are in Basra, and that's when the Lord, in uh, the, the last cha to the chapters 5 and 6 of Hosea, deal with the, the commitment that they need to uh, petition the Lord, forgive their iniquity, namely the rejection of the Messiah, acknowledge him, and petition him to come. And when they do that, on the third day he returns. And that's the sign of the prophet Jonah that he talks about in Matthew in addition to pointing to his resurrection. That's a quick summary of the Zechariah study. If, uh, if you want to get deeper into those heresies, you can go ahead and dig up the Zechariah tapes and, and, uh, and uh, see some of the screwy ideas that we laid on you then. Now again, all these studies should be prefaced with Acts 17, 11, where Luke tells you not to believe anything Chuck Missler tells you, but to search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. And even though I may be wrong, I will take refuge in the fact that at least I've got you to dig into the scripture and maybe stretch your imagination in a couple of areas and uh, leave behind some of the glib cliches that uh, students of prophecy were sometimes guilty of, of uh, uh, hiding behind. So, enough of that. Um, huh. So, um, anyway, Adonai Zedek does an interesting thing. He doesn't go after Joshua, he goes after Gibeon. Kind of interesting. Goes after Gibeon. And so, uh, verse 5, Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up, they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Now this has got to shake up the Gibeonites. I mean, they were strong, but here's an alliance of five, not one, five. And so I have no numbers as to how big they were, but there's a bunch. And... Uh, uh, there's probably as many as there are meteorites on their way, uh, but that's another issue. Um, so, uh, uh, and they're on their way, by the way. That's what's also interesting. If you want to talk about time warps, uh, God has already anticipated all this. But the point is, uh, they camp against Gibeon. Now, uh, you know, siege warfare is a little rough. Uh, you know, you've got to build uh, towers and battering rams and all that stuff. And, of course, that was highly refined by subsequent tribes, particularly the Romans and all that. We've talked about that in the past. Uh, even in this early period, the way you went at a city, the first step was to cut off their supplies. So they, when they says they encamped against Gibeon, it doesn't mean they just positioned themselves. They probably sealed off their routes of supply. And so they're getting ready to, to dig in here. And so Gibeon is, is in trouble. If you're a Gibeonite and you look over the, the wall there and you see five kings and all their forces camped against you, you know that it's, uh, it's uh, 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 going to have an impact on your priorities. Uh, so verse 6. The men of Gibeon do an interesting thing. They're, it's time to play one of the trump cards. So the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp at Gilgal. Bear in mind, Joshua went back to Gilgal. 
And uh, so they're at Gilgal, and Gibeon knows that, so they send messengers and, and, and to uh, Gilgal, saying, Relax not thy hand from thy servant. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So at the local sense, Gibeon is saying, Hey, Joshua, we made our deal with you. It's time. We're calling our card now. Get over here quickly and save us. I'll skip the vernacular, but they, they save us. And uh, Now, in a spiritual sense, it's kind of interesting, too, because Joshua is a type of Christ. You've noticed that. We haven't emphasized that. We've had enough to do. But I think you've probably picked up on the fact that Joshua is a type of Christ. The Gibeonites are saying to, to Joshua, Yehoshua, if you will, Come to us quickly and save us. Is Joshua a savior? Let's watch and see. Does Joshua send back a note and say, hey, by the way, that covenant you did, I don't like the premises, there was some fraudulent thing. No, no. Uh, does Joshua call a committee meeting to discuss this? Doesn't seem to be his style. Uh, verse 7, Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. You get the impression that Joshua doesn't mess around. When he's called, he moves. And he's on his way. And between now and verse 14 is the wildest pas uh, passage in the Scripture in, 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 in several senses. So um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just jump into this as a preview of what we'll really develop next time in more detail. But let's just keep moving because it's kind of fun. Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. Now, that's kind of neat. You see, what is not here, uh, you don't get the impression that Joshua is operating half-cocked. Whether he sought the Lord's counsel or however is not recorded, but we know that the Lord blessed us because the Lord says, hey, don't sweat it. Fear not. And if I was Joshua after some of the episodes, I'd be glad to hear those words. <laughs> For I have delivered them into thy hand. Notice that past tense, I have delivered them. Some thousands of years before, it could very well be that a missing planet was crunched up into small particles to provide the shot for the shotgun that's going to take care of these guys because we're going to have a meteor shower like is like a wild one. Um, it's kind of fun. That's, and that's not the half of it. That's the meteor shower is the easy part. Um, the Lord says, For I have delivered them into thine hand, there shall not a man of them stand before thee. In other words, God has promised Joshua he's going to get them all. Days not going to be long enough to get them all. Watch and see. Furthermore, we're going to learn that not one Israeli was lost because they all are going to return back to camp. There's no, no, no the, the record is not that explicit, but the, the tone of the record is that there were no losses on the part of Israel, which itself is kind of wild. Verse 9, Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night long. They move all night long. October 25th, 1404 B.C. How do I know that date? You'll find out next time. <clears throat> and the Lord routed them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horn and smote them in um, Azekah and unto Makeda. Now, you should get the picture here a little bit, and I, I'm not going to try and draw a map, but if you're going from east to west, there's the Jordan River, there's some lowland starting to rise, there's Gilgal is there, then a little further is Jericho, a little higher is Ai, and you're in the mountains. Just over the mountains is Gibeon. And on the other side of the mountains, there's a valley, the valley of Beth Horon. And then you can go, we've been going westward, going southward, you can go down to Makeda and these other cities. Just to the West a little further is a little valley called Agilon. If you're in the valley of Beth Horon, you can look over to the east and see Gibeon up on the hills. Over on the, uh, 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 to the uh, west, the, the skyline has a notch in it called the Valley of Agilon. That's going to be important to us for some reasons. But the point is that this valley is sort of an escape route. From Gibeon you can go south to get out of there if you've got time. But in verse 10 it says, The Lord routed them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and to Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled 
from before Israel. These are these five kings and their armies. As they fled before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more who died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. That's quite a battle. Well, let's, let's continue for a few verses and then pick up a little bit. Um, hailstones. Wipe these guys out. A large part of them. Not all of them there because they're going to get some of them with the sword. Verse 12. Then spoke Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. Now, some will make a quibble about this. The actual Hebrew says, Son, be thou silent. And some guys argue that, well, all it means is they turn the sun out or something. So that doesn't fit the passage. He told the sun to stand still and the moon in the valley of Agilon. The scripture goes on, verse 13. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon the enemies. And is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Oh, now, come on. You've got to be kidding. I mean, you take the Bible literally? You really believe that the sun stood still and the moon? You've got to be kidding. Now, hailstones, we can sort of buy that, because they may have been supernatural hailstones. Now, it's funny how a scientist, there's a number of things, and we'll, we'll dig into this next time we're together, because I'd I'll, I'll like to present it in a more organized fashion, but there are a number of interesting books that have been written pointing out that all that happened here was a big meteorite shower. And there's all kinds of evidence that I'll review with you next time that we have reason to believe there was a meteor shower of some significance on this particular day. And so, gee, that's great. The meteor shower knocked off these guys. Well, you're going to find out a little later on that um, it's a little more complicated than that because none of the Israelis got hit. And that's marksmanship. You want to have, you want to do some marble trajectories with computers and plan where those meteorites should go and the re-entry so they hit the right guys while they're in motion and do all this in advance. Ooh, that's my kind of guy that I want on my side. Uh, it might be useful to continue here a little bit because the, 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 we're not through with these guys. Uh, and Joshua returned and all Israel with them unto the camp in Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Mekeda. So the, the army's been wiped out, but the five kings have bugged out and they found a place to hide, right, in the cave at Mekeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hidden in the cave at Mekeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men to guard them. And stay ye not there, but pursue after your enemies and smite the rear of them. Permit them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord God hath delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass when Joshua and the children of Israel had ceased slaying them in a very great slaughter, till they were consumed, that the rest who remained of them entered into fortified cities. And all the people returned to the camp, at, uh, uh, returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda uh, in peace. And none moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. And uh, uh, then said Joshua. Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so, and they brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, and uh, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, and the king of Jarmuth, and the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war who went with him, Come near and put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, and be not dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. Joshua's really grandstanding this. They wipe out virtually all of them. A few apparently didn't get to fortified cities. They come back, having these kings contained. They've hidden this thing. They seal off the cave. Knock off all the rest of what they can get their hands on. Come back. Open the cave. Bring these guys out. And Joshua's really, he's grandstanding for his troops. Got his feet on all the... Uh, he, uh, put your feet on the necks of these guys, and he says, and he gives them a speech. If you're not beat, us made. 
be not dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hung them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until evening. Calling attention, of course, to the passage in Deuteronomy, which is picked up by Paul in Galatians 3.13. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. This is uh, establishing the pattern. The king of Jericho hung on a tree. Ai. And here we have uh, um, these uh, five kings hanging on trees. And I can just guess at what the king of Gibeon must have felt as he watched all this, figuring it worked. Verse 27, It came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded, and they took them down of the, from the trees and cast them into the cave in which they had hidden and laid great stones in the cave's mouth which remain unto this very day. And that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword, and its king he utterly destroyed. Them and all the souls that were in it, that he let none remain, so did he to the king of Makeda as he did to the king of Jericho. And this completes what's sometimes called the Southern Campaign. There's going to be more to the book of Joshua, but it's going to be in less detail as we knock off some of these things. Uh, I've talked several times about parallels between the book of Revelation. I have to call your attention to Revelation chapter 6. Small point, but kind of fun. Revelation chapter 6. And uh, this is the opening of the um, sixth seal. Remember the seventh sealed book in the book of Revelation? All kinds of strange things occur. But when we open the sixth seal, that's verses 15 and 16 of chapter 6, it says, The kings of the earth, now we're talking about the whole earth, not just the land of Canaan. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the, ch and the chief captains and the mighty men and every slave and every freedman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Interesting remark. Just part of the, the sweep in that part of the book of Revelation. But it's provocative to me that we have the kings of the earth described in Revelation chapter 6 in terms that I argue are somewhat idiomatic of Joshua, where the kings who are the victims of God's attack are hiding in caves, uh, hiding under the rocks. And, and uh, we have, of course, that dramatized as a foreshadowing, if you will, in the book of Joshua. And one of the many little hints that, in my mind, uh, point us to the book of Revelation. But I don't want to leave what I think is one of the most provocative passages in the Scripture. Uh, you might turn with me on an unrelated, but maybe it is an unrelated, passage. Uh, and let's pick it up. Uh, there's several verses of this, but let's turn on. Turn to Isaiah 38. This is a passage that occurs many, 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 many years later. It occurred where Joshua is roughly 14 centuries before Christ. King Hezekiah is roughly 7 centuries before Christ. So this is some nominally, approximately 700 years later. And in this passage, Hezekiah is ill and he's healing, and um, he, uh, he, asks, uh, 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 he asks the Lord to uh, let him live longer. And the Lord, uh, in verse 5, says, uh, the first uh, 4 says, The word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord God, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, and behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. Hezekiah was, didn't want to die yet. He wanted to live another 15 years. Before it's over, he probably wishes he'd left it alone. But the point is, he does ask for 15 years. And God gives him another 15 years. And my recommendation is I wouldn't pray for that. Uh, but that's another issue. Uh, and the Lord says in verse 6, I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. By the way, it may not be obvious, but I recommend you study the whole issue of Sennacherib and the angel that slaughtered 185,000 Syrians. Because the mechanism there is different. Where Joshua, in, in the Battle of Beth Horon, God used meteorites. It's the belief of some scientists here he used a, a bolide. Now, a bolide is like a meteor. A meteor is typically iron, nickel, and steel, and it's something when it enters the atmosphere, it becomes a rock. It sometimes gets molten and glows, but it's basically a rock. And if it doesn't get consumed in the atmosphere, it hits you on the head. It can, you know, it can be effective, as apparently the uh, uh, Adonai Zedek furnace. A bolide is like a meteor, but it's made of consumables of certain kinds, and when it hits the atmosphere, it causes an explosion. In 1908 in Siberia, a bolide was heard some, uh, that landed in, a, in, in Siberia, that was heard some two th several thousand miles away. It, the explosion was so loud. It seared forests for miles. Fortunately, it was an un uninhabited area, but it was reported and heard and also searched afterwards as a well-documented. Some scientists say it was a comet that landed there. Other people believe it was a bolide. 
And if you uh, think these things are strange, you should take a, go to Winslow, Arizona sometime, or better yet, fly over it in a plane. Uh, you'll discover there's a thing called a meteor crater near Winslow, Arizona. There's one problem. Where's the meteor? It could be that was a bolide, not a meteor. That is, it may have been an explosion, but still leaves a crater. Now, the point is, though, going on with this a minute here with Hezekiah, it says in verse 6, I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the Assyria, and I will defend the city. And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord. The Lord will do this thing that he has spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backwards. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it had gone down. And it goes on. In other words, God gives Hezekiah a sign. I'm going to, make you li- I'm going to let you live 15 years longer and to prove it to you. If you go out there and watch the sundial, I'll move the, sun, the shadow back ten degrees. You've got to be kidding I mean, how could that happen? Well, that could happen lots of ways, maybe. You know, it could be refraction in the sky. God bent the light rays. That's one way. Uh, he could maybe move the earth a little bit. Doesn't have to bother the sun. Lots of ways, maybe. But these are bizarre ideas. You and I have a tough time. I don't care how sincere you are about believing the word of God. You have to have trouble. Instinctively, I have to believe. You have trouble visualizing these things literally. Literally. Um... You and I are, have grown up in the comfort of what I'll call uniformity. These planets, nothing is more sure. If you ever t- t- attend a planetarium show, or if you ever watch with interest how we put up you know, satellites and how we do space travel, nothing is more certain or predictable than the sidereal and planetary movements in our solar system, the sidereal movements of the stars and the, the movements of our, our solar system. We're used to peace in the solar system. And we're taught, you and I have been taught in high school and college, that's the way it always was. What, the, what our instructors probably assume is that we won't take a good look at the moon. Now, you can't tell me by looking at the moon that it's always been very peaceful in the solar system. The moon has been beat up pretty bad. <laughs> we look at the Earth, and we see the meteor crater in Winslow, Arizona. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to explore next time a number of what I'll call catastrophes in the Scripture. Those of you that want to prepare for next time, if you can get your hands on a book by the name of Worlds in Collision by Emanuel Vilikowski, it was published in 1950. It's not written by a believer. It's a book when published was given a good horse laugh by most scientists. That was 1950. Now, three decades later, a lot of people are taking him very seriously. Now, don't misunderstand. There are some other ideas. He just has, he raises some interesting questions. And he has some interesting theories. And you, I don't believe, will find a more interesting book just to stretch your view of the planet Earth and what happened in the centuries. He basically believes that the solar system was still in upheaval and settled down only within the memory of man. And the events that are described in China, Maya, the Aztecs, and the rest are, are evidence that the solar system was in upheaval. And uh, we'll talk about that next time. I'm also going to share with you the findings of three mathemati- guys that have done uh, orbital mechanics and have built a model of, of another whole scenario, a little different than Vilikowski's, and one that's vastly, to me, far more interesting. But I think you will leave after that review, even though it may not be quite accurate, it is, it'll stretch your horizon as to what really happened in those ancient cultures. Why was Rome founded where it was? so far from the sea. No, like, not a likely place for Rome to be founded. Why was Rome? Was it to, re- to, to resist 100-foot tidal waves and so forth? Why do we have Mars and Venus, which are Baal and Ashtoreth to the Phoenicians, but Mars and Venus to the other ancient cultures? Um, why were they so feared by everybody, not just a group of priests that happened to have a, you know, a observatory or something, like Stonehenge? And um, why did people tremble and uh, we're going to explore the hypotheses of some orbital mechanics and explore what apparently happened on seven different occasions that we know of in the scripture, separated by 108-year periods. We're going to talk about uh, the orbits of uh, Mars and the Earth and uh, some of the evidences that lead from that. And we're even going to explore the writings of Jonathan Swift in some bizarre ways. And you will leave after that study with a whole different view. Uh, you, I think, will end up being far more sympathetic with these frightened people that bowed the knee to these strange images and worshipped the golden calf and other symbols of either Mars or Venus, depending who you're talking to. And uh, so uh, we're going to explore that next time. Um, The long day of Joshua. 
and some related kinds of subjects in terms of our view of the, how literal the scripture is. And after you see next time, when you read Joel and Amos and Isaiah, and they talk about the mountains melting, and you hear all this poetic language in the certain Psalms and, and among the ancient Hebrew prophets, you're going to come to the amazing discovery that they're not using poetic language at all. They're trying as best they can to describe what was really happening on the planet Earth in 701 B.C., 1404 B.C., and has impact on, like as I say, seven. So that's next time, the long day of Joshua in, in a cosmological...